Hi, this is Bedrest Coach Darlene Turner Lee, owner and founder of Mamas on Bedrest and Beyond. And yes, today I look a little hellacious, but that's okay. I came in from walking. Yes, I'm sporting one of my favorite t-shirts, Van Gogh's cat. Isn't this cute? Anyway, I came in from walking and I really wanted to um, get this uh, video blog out to you because I just feel like, you know how you read something and it strikes you and you go, wait a minute. That, uh. Anyway, I'm going to talk about, um, there is a study that came across my desk from um, one of my partners, Pregnancy.org, and it's called Pain Management for Women in Labor, an Overview of Systemic Reviews. Now, this is one of these really heavy medicalese type of things that if the average person reads, your head's going to start to spin because of all the medical jargon and how they did it. But for geeks like me, who the title in and of itself caught my eye, I said, I got to look at this because it's one of those things that it can hit the airwaves, it can hit the media, and next thing you know, it's on the Today Show, Good Morning America, the Evening News, and I just feel like the information might be a little bit misleading. So anyway, this is what the skinny is. The article is called Pain Management for Women in Labor, an Overview of Systemic systematic excuse me systematic reviews and it's written by I'm not gonna read everybody because there's a whole lot of people and if you really want it it's in the Cochrane library and I just printed this out here you can see that and um, I can give the citation if people want to see it in fact I'll put it at the base of the um, blog information for you but what caught my eye was um, I started reading the abstract and it says um, the pain that women experience during labor is affected by multiple physiological and psychological factors and its intensity can vary greatly. We all know this. Most women in labor require pain relief um, of some sort. Pain management strategies include non-pharmacologic interventions that aim to help women cope with pain in labor and pharmacologic in interventions that aim to relieve the pain of labor. So the object of this particular paper was to summarize the evidence from Cochrane systematic reviews on the efficacy and safety of non-pharmacologic and pharmacological interventions to manage pain and labor. And um, we consider findings from non-Cochrane systematic reviews if there was no relevant Co Cochrane review. So it's, I mean, overall, I will say, as a scientific person, this was a really pretty well done, um, the way they did it, it was pretty well done. You know, they took a whole bunch of um, reviews and they, they searched the Cochrane database. And let's see, they said they used 15 Cochrane reviews, which had 255 trials, and then three non-Cochrane reviews, which had uh, 55 trials. So, I mean, there's a lot of data that they looked at. And they were um, trying to evaluate what works, what doesn't work. I don't know if they were trying to say what they would recommend or not. I, I think they were trying to be objective. I have to say, I feel they felt, uh, fell a hair short, and I'll tell you why. Um, they separated their findings into what works, what may work, and um, insufficient evidence, which I think is better language than what doesn't work because saying something doesn't work when you don't have a lot of data or evidence can be a little tricky. But anyway, so this is what they had in what works. Um, evidence suggests that epidural, combined spinal epidural, and inhaled analgesia effectively manage pain and labor but may give rise to adverse effects. Epidural and inhaled analgesia effectively relieve pain when compared with placebo or a different type of intervention, meaning epidural versus opioids or, you know, which is morphine and those types of things. Combined spinal epidurals relieve pain more quickly than the traditional or low-dose epidurals. Women receiving inhaled analgesia were more likely to experience vomiting, nausea, and uh, dizziness, which, oh yeah, that stuff will just wreck with you. When compared with placebo, with placebo or opioids, women receiving epidural analgesia had more instrumental vaginal births and cesarean sections for fetal distress. Now, I thought that was really interesting that they put that in there. So um, if you were to get 
epidural analgesia. You're more likely to have instrumentation during your birth or cesarean section, although there was no difference in the rates of cesarean sections overall. Women receiving epidural anesthesia analgesia were more likely to experience hypotension, meaning a drop in blood pressure, motor blockade, meaning you know their motor function just kind of got wiped out, meaning you know, they weren't feeling their legs and weren't able to move properly, fever or urinary retention, because again, it numbs, but it numbs everything in the area. Less urinary retention was, was observed in women receiving um, combined spinal epidurals than women receiving traditional epi epidurals. More women receiving combined uh, spinal epidurals than low-dose epidurals experienced puritus, meaning they, it, it makes you itch. And I remember getting this when I was pregnant. Uh, I think it was with my daughter. I just itched like the dickens. So that's their take on um, this is what they have as what works, what they know for sure. And it makes sense because this is a medical paper. What they have in terms of what works is the medical things that are typically used in the medically, medical setting. Those are the epidurals. That's the face mask anesthesia. So now we come to what may work. There is some evidence to suggest that immersion in water relaxation, acupuncture, massage, and local anesthetic nerve blocks or non-opioid drugs may improve management of labor pain with fewer adverse effects. Evidence was mainly limited to single trials. These interventions relieved pain and improved satisfaction with pain relief, immersion, relaxation, acupuncture, blah, 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 blah and childbirth experience. So women who used these methods had improved satisfaction with their pain relief um, when compared with placebo or standard care. Relaxation was associated with fewer assisted vaginal births, meaning there was no instrumentation, baby was just allowed to slide out, and acupuncture was associated with fewer assisted vaginal births and cesareans. So again, when you used relaxation or acupuncture, at least from what they found, babies were allowed to just kind of come naturally, not a lot of instrumentation, women were satisfied with their pain management, and things seemed to go pretty well. So there's some good stuff there. Insufficient evidence. Now these methods, insufficient. there is insufficient evidence to make judgments on whether or not hypnosis, biofeedback, sterile water injection, aromatherapy, TENS, or parental opioid, good lordy, parental opioids are more effective than placebo or other interventions for pain management. So there are some things they just don't know. They didn't really have enough data to make a conclusion. They couldn't find enough studies where these other methods had been used in order to compare. And, and I think that's really important. What I like about this is that they say insufficient evidence because I've seen papers where they say, well, they're just not effective. And my take on that is, well, how do you know? Because you didn't have enough people to sample and ask and, and try it out on to say whether or not it works. So I think they did a good job with that. Um, in comparison with other opioids, more women receiving, ew, I don't know what this is, pethidine experienced adverse effects, including drowsiness and nausea. So there, there were some things that happened. Um, this is, I guess it's a type of opioid and I, I have not heard that, but you know, that's neither here nor it's not like I know all the opioids. But I thought they did a really good job in saying there was insufficient evidence to make a judgment on whether or not hypnosis, biofeedback, sterile water injection, aromatherapy, TENS, or parenteral opioids are more effective than placebo or other inter interventions. Um, their conclusions, and I'm going to just read the plain language conclusion because they have the kind of medical ease one, which you know I read and went, hmm. But I'm going to read you the plain one, and then I'm just going to kind of give you my little take on the whole situation. Um, Women's experience of pain during labor varies greatly. Yeah. Some women feel little pain whilst others find the pain extremely distressing. A woman's position in labor, mobility, and fear and anxiety, or conversely, confidence may influence her experience of pain. We know this. If you ask people who do more traditional midwifery, if a woman feels confident that she can do it, she does much better. Several drug and non-drug interventions are available, and in this overview, we have assessed 18 systemic reviews of different interventions used to reduce pain and labor, 15 of these being Cochrane reviews. So, you know, they've looked at a lot of data. Most of the evidence on non-drug intervention 
was based on just one or two studies, so the findings are not definitive, which is very true. However, we found that immersion in water, relaxation, acupuncture, and massage all gave pain relief and better satisfaction with pain relief. Immersion and relaxation also gave better satisfaction with childbirth, so keep that in mind. Both relaxation and acupuncture decreased the use of forceps and ventulous with acupuncture also decreasing the number of cesarean sections. So this is really important information. If you're trying to reduce having um, forceps, vacuum extraction, or a cesarean section, they're saying um, relaxation, acupuncture, and water immersion actually did this. Um, Let's see, there was insufficient evidence to make a judgment based on whether or not hypnosis, biofeedback, sterile water injection, aromatherapy, and TENS are effective for pain relief in labor. And, and this is, I think, the crux of the, the study here or the data that is prevented. Overall, there were more studies of drug interventions, inhaled nitrous oxide and oxygen, relieved pain, but some women felt drowsy, nauseous, or were sick. Non-opioid drugs relieved pain and some gave greater satisfaction with pain relief than placebo or no treatment. Um, but satisfaction with pain relief was less than opioids. Epidurals relieved pain but increased the number of births needing forceps or ventus. Or ventus? Ventus. Ooh, I think I'm saying that one. Ventus. And the risk of low blood pressure, motor blocks, Fever and urinary retention were increased doing these. Combined spinal epidurals gave faster pain relief, but more women had itching than with epidurals alone, although urinary retention was less likely to be a problem. Local anesthetic nerve blocks gave satisfaction but caused side effects of giddiness, sweating, tingling, and more babies had low heart rates. Parenteral opioids are less effective than epidural, but there was insufficient evidence to make a judgment on whether or not they are more effective than other interventions for pain in labor. Overall, women should feel free to choose whatever pain management they feel would help them most during labor. Women who choose non-drug pain management should feel free, if needed, to move on to drug intervention. During pregnancy, women should be told about the benefits and, and potential adverse effects on themselves and their babies of the different methods of pain control. Individual studies showed considerable variation in how outcomes such as pain intensity were measured, and some important outcomes were rarely or not. Um, for example, sense of control and labor, breastfeeding, mother and baby interaction, costs and infant outcomes. Further research is needed on the non-drug interventions for pain management and labor. And, you know, one, I think this is a really well done and well reported um, study because they really did say we don't have the evidence to make the comparison. We don't know. I mean, we could find out down the road that hypnosis is phenomenal. Um, what I think, one of the things that caught my eye about this is because um, in the title on uh, pregnancy.org, it was something like um, study finds uh, drug-induced uh, pain management more effective or something. I mean, but the title was kind of, ooh, you know, you need to use drugs. And that was my thing that was saying, no, let's not say that because pregnancy and labor are different for everyone. And, you know, truth be told, pregnancy and labor is different from one pregnancy to another. For example, my first pregnancy was a train wreck. I just felt horrible, lousy, nasty. It felt like nothing we tried worked well. Second pregnancy couldn't have been more different. I was still high risk because of everything that had happened before. But comparatively speaking, other than being larger than life, things went really, really well. My son went to term. I did deliver him C-section, but no complications. I didn't bleed like I did the first time. You know, things were great. So it's really hard to say. Literally, I mean, I'm the same woman, but, you know, two different pregnancies. What's going to work? What's going to be different? The point I wanted to reiterate in, in looking at this study and looking at um, how things are often presented in the media is you get that big, wide, you know, use of medication during labor and delivery is more effective in pain relief than, you know, these alternative methods. And you get these kind of glaring headlines and titles, and that's what's caught, picked up by the media. And what was upsetting to me as I read that 
was the thought of, oh gosh, you know, maybe mamas on bed rest are reading this or hearing this or it's coming across on their email or on their Twitter. And, and they may have been planning to do hypnobirthing or they may have been planning to do um, water immersion if that's possible with some of the high risk things it's not. Or they may have hired a doula and been really practicing these relaxation techniques and getting, you know, spinal massage and sacral massage and all this stuff and were really feeling good about how they were going to labor and hearing a you know kind of a flashy headline may make them go oh well maybe i should have this epidural or maybe i should do this and the fact being they may not need it and we see here that they state very clearly that there is an increased use of forceps and other instrumentation increased risk for cesarean section. So I just wanted women to know, you know, and, and, it, and I, like I said, I give the authors credit. They clearly state this in their summary, but the summaries or even, and I'm just reading the abstract. This whole abstract isn't what's given in the news. When you hear news reports, or oftentimes when you see things reported in the news, they're written in say 30 second sound bites. I mean, me even here talking to you now, I've gone through what, um, 16 minutes. You don't get this much time. So you get these quote unquote highlights with all of the brouhaha, if you were, oh, this is what's happening in it. And it's, you just don't get that other side. So I really wanted to raise women's awareness, raise mamas on bed rest awareness of know, know that there are things available that you can try. Try biofeedback, try acupuncture, try hypnosis if you want to. Because I always say, you know, if it's not completely contraindicated to your situation and you want to try it, try it. Because you you know this too, the epidural is going to be there. Now, granted, they always say there's certain windows when you can do it, blah, 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 blah. But if you get into trouble and you need some pain management, they're going to find a way to get it to you. You know, if something happens in the hospital and, you know, if they have to C-section you, what have you, they will anesthetize you. It may be they have to knock you out, but in the event it needs to happen, you will have it. But if you want to at least try to manage it yourself and to really breathe through it and to experience your whole labor and delivery, provided it's not a contraindication to your condition, provided it's not a contraindication to the condition of your baby, it's not going to put you guys at risk, then yes, go ahead and try it because like this um, review says, and again, I, I just really want to applaud them for stating this in this way. We don't have enough data. And I would love to see, you know, classical science, if you will, however you want to term it, you know, these raw researchers work with some of these practitioners. And let's see if we could get, you know, 200 women who did hypnobirthing, for example, or hypnosis during childbirth, because I think hypnobirthing is a trademark name, but hypnosis during childbirth. And look at versus 200 women who did the epidural and see how it fleshes out. I mean, if we could really do it, it would be great to see if we could get 200 women who had epidurals and then on a subsequent pregnancy did something else. But even that gets sketchy because, you know, you can have one great pregnancy and one crappy pregnancy. So, eh. But just taking, say, 200 women who had an epidural versus 200 women who were doing hypnosis and see how it pans out. Or 200 women with the epidural, 200 women with hip hypnosis, 200 women with water birth, and then 200 women with acupuncture, acupressure. And let's see how it all fleshes out. How do women do? How do babies do? What are the C-section rates? What are the use of forceps rates? What are, you know, vacuum extraction rates? You know, how does it really compare? Then I think we're really going to be on to something. Again, it would really require the medical community working with some of the ancillary technologies, but I think in the end it could have phenomenal, phenomenal inf implications, and it would really give women and their partners a whole lot of information and a whole lot of choice when they're thinking about their, their childbirthing experience. So again, I thought this was a pretty cool study, but keep in mind, you know, we don't have all the information. If you came across this study and kind of went away with, oh, gee, maybe I shouldn't be doing something else. Maybe I should think of the epidural. Don't throw it out yet. Talk to your doctor about it. I would say at the very least, especially if you're thinking of something like hypnosis and biofeedback, go ahead and do it anyway, because when you're having a baby, you need all the 
tools in your toolbox that you can get. So if you can stay calm, if you can be relaxed and feel like you're really up for this, all the better. Because even if you get an epidural, it's just going to be better for you so, to have that sense of calm and peace. So I say go with it. Go with it. But but yes, give it a shot. Don't be completely bowled over and think, oh, well, I was training, you know, and I was studying this hypnosis, but maybe I'll stop now. Please don't. Again, like this summary says, we don't know enough yet. And most of these techniques seem to be safe given certain circumstances. So talk with your doctor about it. Whatever you're going to do, get a skilled practitioner in that particular discipline, whether it be acupuncture, active pressure, um, hypnosis, biofeedback. Get someone who knows what they're doing, who has done a lot of this, especially with women in pregnancy and childbirth, and be trained. Work on it. Learn it. Know it. Know how it works. And then go for it and have just a wonderful, hopefully happy, safe, and healthy birth and a healthy, happy baby. So this is Bedrest Coach Darlene Turner Lee looking a little less professional today, coming in from a walk, but was really just thinking about this as I was walking along and wanting to give my two cents on um, the uses of uh, different pain management me uh, methods on uh, labor and delivery so that mamas on bed rest and other mamas who may listen to this will really know to weigh their options, really think about what's available to them and make wise informed choices. That's it for today. I'm Darlene Turner-Lee, bed rest coach, owner and founder of Mamas on Bed Rest and Beyond. Thanks for listening.